Okay, let's uh, begin with the last talk of this session. Our next speaker is Joseph Moore from Princeton University. His talk is titled A Linguistic Analogy for Moral Intuitions. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks, David and Raphael, for organizing and, and for having me. Thank all of you for attending. Um, so I'll preface this by saying I am primarily a moral philosopher. Uh, I only have done you know, rudimentary uh, research into linguistics and generative grammar. Um, so I'll be especially interested to see what the real linguists and the real philosophers of language and linguistics think. Um, you know, so let me know if this is all uh, completely off base. Uh, but I'll also just be interested to hear, you know, whatever your thoughts are on the topic. So <clears throat> there's a just to catch everyone up to speed in case, um, uh, you know, you're not familiar with like the practices of uh, moral philosophy. There's a very common moral philosophical practice um, to invoke moral intuitions in your uh, arguments. Um, so sorry, I'm just trying to adjust my zoom real quick so I can see the slides too. There we go. Um, so just some stock examples, some very famous examples. Um, Philip Afoot introduced the trolley problem discussing the doctrine of double effect. Um, it's not important what that is, but she uh, invokes these intuitions that it's morally permissible to divert a trolley towards one person to save five others. Um, and that it's morally impermissible to push someone in front of a trolley to save five others. Uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson on abortion relies on intuitions about hypothetical cases that it's morally permissible not to provide your own kidneys for a stranger's nine month dialysis. Um, and also that it's morally permissible, although she says uh, indecent, very provocatively, but morally permissible not to touch someone's forehead to cure them, uh, even if you're just like down the hall or in the same room or what have you. And uh, Peter Singer arguing for, um, you know, donating substantially to international aid, uh, relies on intuitions that it's morally required to save a child who's drowning in a nearby shallow pond. And um, rather than like a particular moral intuition, also a moral intuition that's like a mid-level principle or a comparative judgment that donating to save a distant person from starvation is morally equivalent to saving a nearby child from drowning. So this, um, these are some older examples, but you can find uh, the use of moral intuitions and in moral philosophy across the board. And uh, these moral intuitions are uh, generally agreed by moral epistemologists to uh, count as evidence and to justify moral beliefs um, and generate moral knowledge. So Jeff McMahon writes, um, at least some of our moral intuitions have a presumptive epistemic authority. And although the deeper principles are explanatorily prior, uh, we have to work our way to them. That is like the deep moral principles uh, via our intuitions and much the way that scientists work towards general principles via perceptual data. So we use these intuitions as data. They allow us to come up with uh, the general principles that explain the data. Um, Michael Humer says, at least some moral truths are known in intuitively, uh, that is directly rather than on the basis of other truths, but not by the five senses. Um, so it's not just that we, uh, we know some self evident, high level moral principles, uh, but rather we, we can come to some moral truths, intuitively, whatever that means. Um, and it's also not uh, perceptual. Um, and then TM Scanlon describing uh, reflective equilibrium also says we have reason to believe the things that seem to us to be true about these subjects, um, in particular normative subjects, but he's also thinking of like mathematics and, and things like that. Um, when we are thinking about them under the right conditions, it is appropriate for us to treat these beliefs as considered judgments in a process of seeking reflective equilibrium if we have no apparent reason to doubt them. Um, and these uh, these philosophers are um, have pretty different, broad meta ethical pictures, uh, broad moral epistemological pictures, but, but they all generally agree that um, in, intuitions play some sort of uh, evidential epistemological role um, in generating moral knowledge. Um, so with that sort of as as a presupposition of the talk, these are the two questions that I want to focus on. First, what are moral intuitions? Um, and indeed, like what causes them, what explains them? Um, not just 
uh, not just the like a debate you could have about like what what we're talking about when we use the word moral intuitions. And then also, given that so many philosophers are optimistic about their evidential uh, their role and, and their uh, epistemological role as justifying moral beliefs. Um, once we've settled what moral intuitions are, uh, does the nature of moral intuitions vindicate that epistemological role? So I'll start with the first question. Um, and just as, as uh, for like, you know, setting the stage, uh, these are, I wanted to set down some theory neutral features of, of moral intuitions. Um, stuff that like everyone should roughly agree to, even if they disagree about other things. So most paradigmatically, uh, moral intuitions are quick, explicit judgments about actions and attitudes, um, including judgments of, say, permissibility and blameworthiness. Um, we might use more uh, intuition more broadly and include um, implicit or unconscious judgments that, that might not rise to the level of explicit consciousness. Also, um, slower judgments about complex cases. Uh, this is uh, this might be how Scanlon uses it when he when he talks about considered judgments instead of just like immediate, uh, unreflective uh, intuitions. And we might also think that intuitions can include non-propositional affective responses. Um, so maybe not just the proposition or like the judgment that. Uh, a certain act is wrong, but maybe just a sort of inchoate felt moral outrage or, or admiration in response to um, a case, you know, hypothetical or, or real. Um, and it's, it's agreed by everyone that I've read anyway, that moral intuitions are not sense perceptions, but they might be like sense perceptions in involving um, defeasible representations, sometimes called seemings or appearances. Um, so, like I said, that's meant to be theory neutral, uh, just like what, what is the, um, the explananda that we're trying to, to explain with a theory of intuitions. Um, and so, with that on the table, we can proceed to some of the most popular explanations of moral intuitions. Uh, the first is called intuitionism, and that's the view that moral intuitions are the result of a sui generis faculty with direct access to moral facts or more generally a priori knowable facts. Um, so whether, whether you're just talking about moral intuitionism or a broader like rational intuitionism, the idea is that there's, there is some uh, you know, interesting cognitive structure in the brain that whose sole job is to get us uh, in direct contact with, with these facts. Um, I'll, uh, I'll return more, I'll return to that in a second. Um, we also have rationalism, which is a view that moral intuitions are the result of quick but conscious reasoning from explicitly represented moral principles. So roughly when you, um, when you have a moral intuition, uh, your, your reasoning may be very quickly, but you're still reasoning from some principles that you, know, you could uh, formulate. Um, and it's, it's no surprise here that uh, the, some of the people described as holding a view like this are actually these um, developmental psychologists, because in particular, they're thinking about um, like children's intuitions and children's responses. Um, and, you know, they're, they're conducting studies where they'll ask a child what they think about a case, and then they'll also ask them, uh, like, why and what reasons they give. And the child will, you know, say something about it's not fair or, you know, they, they, uh, they were acting for themselves or something like that. Um, so they, they're conducting studies where people are providing these, these explanations. Uh, we also have uh, the view called sentimentalism, or at least I'll describe it as sentimentalism, uh, that claims that moral intuitions either are or at least result from affective responses that don't involve any kind of reasoning. Um, so you, you might you know, whether you're a cognitivist or non-cognitivist about moral judgments, um, you'll think that uh, what's really doing the work of generating moral intuitions is, um, is these affective responses, just these uh, like feelings we have, these attitudes we have towards things. Um, and finally, the view I'm going to be defending is uh, what, I'll, what I've called implicitism, uh, for lack of a better name, if you have a, if a better suggestion, I'd be glad to hear it. Um, but I'm going to be defending the view that moral intuitions are the result of often unconscious reasoning from implicitly represented rules or principles. And this is the view 
Um, again, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the view that I think is similar to what we find in um, certain areas of uh, linguistics, including, I think, generative grammar, maybe other uh, you know, methodologies as well. Um, but uh, the, the main thing I wanna do here is provide a, a philosophical argument. There are some people who are interested in, um, in these things and approach it from a very empirical and, and uh, you know, cog sci moral psychology approach. Um, I, I just intend to give a sort of abductive argument that if these are the options on the table, um, then and we can rule out the first three options, then you know, that's a defeasible argument in favor of uh, the final option. Um, so with that in mind, um, let's start with intuitionism, uh, which posits a sui generis faculty with direct access. Um, so this rational or moral faculty is meant to be akin to our perceptual faculties, although not, uh, not necessarily like literally perceptual, um, which provide us with fallible but often reliable access to natural facts. And the idea is if we are set up with some kind of faculty that gives us direct access to these, uh, these rational or moral facts. Um, even if we can be wrong, we might have to be set up in the right sort of conditions or, or what have you, but um, it seems like, you know, there'll be pretty reliable guides to those facts in the same way that uh, eyesight is pretty reliable guide to um, the macroscopic uh, objects around us, even if um, we can be. Uh, the main problem with this view and, um, you know, this, this might be a rather short dismissal, um, comes from, it's, it's roughly the sort of uh, metaphysical and epistemological queerness objections raised by, for instance, Mackey, um, that uh, intuitionism would, would involve a special faculty of moral perception or intuition that would be utterly different from our ordinary ways of knowing everything else uh, and involving none of our ordinary accounts of sensory perception or introspection or the framing and confirming of explanatory hypotheses or inference or logical construction or conceptual analysis or any combination of these. Um, in short, it really just doesn't fit in with the sort of naturalistic uh, worldview uh, that many of us um, want to accept as a, as a background in philosophy. Um, and yeah, there's just, uh, you know, philosophers can posit these the special faculty, but if there's really no uh, basis for it in psychology and cognitive science, then we have really good reason to doubt it. Um, uh, I'll say, you know, I'm not, um, I don't have the bent that like, we have to, uh, like, we have to strictly adhere to whatever cognitive science tells us or psychology tells us. But I, I do think it's true that a sui generis faculty would be a metaphysically extravagant posit for a philosopher to make, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy for a psychologist or a cognitive scientist to, to point out this sort of cognitive architecture faculty, but um, as a philosopher, I would say that uh, it should really only be a, a last resort um, if there's not a better um, explanation of, of moral intuitions, and I think there is. Um, so I will move on from intuitionism. Uh, the next view is rationalism. So moral intuition is a result of quick but conscious reasoning from explicitly represented moral principles. Uh, these moral principles could be explicitly learned. They might be uh, learned very frequently through uh, testimony, um, and they might also be reasoned to via any more general rational process, whether that's um, any of the rational processes that, um, that philosophers uh, uh, sometimes appeal to, like self-evidence, dialectic, deductive argument, transcendental argument, conceptual analysis, reflective equilibrium. Um, now, the problem for this sort of view, um, and it's, uh, I'm going to appeal to uh, some of my opponents on, on the, this point, um, uh, so like hate, for instance, uh, did this moral psychological work, um, suggesting that, uh, people really can't, uh, always, uh, provide their sort of rational justifications for, for their views. And, um, so just to dis briefly describe hate's work, he, um, and his, um, co-authors performed studies asking people for their moral intuitions about various cases, cases like incest and um, uh, some, some like private uh, sexual acts that are generally perceived as indecent, um, but are either between consenting adults or only involve a single person. Um, and you know these sorts of cases and ask for people's intuitions. Um, and so that crucially, they were always meant to be cases where there's no harm um, 
that anyone receives, but uh, most people feel as if it's somehow morally wrong. Um, and describing these cases, Haight says, uh, stories were carefully constructed so that no plausible harm could be found, and most participants directly stated that nobody was hurt by the actions in question, yet participants still usually said the actions were wrong and universally wrong. Furthermore, their, their affective responses to the stories, uh, statements that it would bother them to witness the action, were better predictors of their moral judgments than were their claims about harmful consequences. Um, participants were often morally dumbfounded, uh, that is, they would stutter, laugh, and express surprise at their inability to find supporting reasons, yet they would not change their initial judgments of condemnation. Uh, so, uh, you know, some people have pushed back against uh, hate's findings, but uh, it seems not implausible to me uh, that moral dumbfounding is a widespread uh, phenomenon. And uh, that it's true that very often people can't uh, necessarily provide, uh, you know, super clear justifications, uh, rational arguments, uh, rational derivations of their moral intuitions. Um, uh, that's certainly been my experience in, uh, in moral philosophy, both in, in research and, and teaching students. Um, you know, it seems like it's, it's really actually a surprisingly difficult task to come up with the sorts of uh, principles and justifications and explanations that would account for um, and justify moral, our moral intuitions. So um, it doesn't seem like this is something that's going on all the time uh, for everyone that has a moral intuition. Um, Haight then and others have defended a, uh, a view at the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, sentimentalism, which claims that moral intuitions are a result from affective responses. Um, now, uh, so they take these affective responses like uh, disgust at incest, for example, um, or admiration of pro-social behavior. Those are the, meant to be the ground level mental explanations. Um, but uh, uh, in order to uh, fully flesh out the view, they, they might also appeal to some non-mental explanations for these affective responses. Uh, generally, the hypothesis is going to be that certain affective responses evolved because they were biolog bi biologically advantageous, either to individuals or to groups. Um, and it's clear to it's clear in some cases why how this is plausible. Um, you know, if incest is uh, maladaptive, uh, it would make sense that it would be adaptive for uh, a species to develop disgust at it. Um, similarly, you know, we uh, it's very adaptive uh, to individuals and species uh, to to engage in prosocial behavior. Um, if admiration leads to more prosocial behavior, then it seems like um, a sort of um, mentally brute admiration for that um, would be would be adaptive. Um, and on these views, uh, we might employ reasoning uh, to justify our moral intuitions, but uh, primarily that's that's going to be post hoc rationalization, which isn't necessarily to say it's like bad. Um, uh, part of at least hates account is to explain how you know this this post hoc rationalization really does serve important functions because we. Um, we want to coordinate our moral judgments and our moral expectations, um, and and our uh, you know post hoc rationalizing might be uh, crucial to doing that and might be useful, um, but uh, it is supposed to be where the rationalizing comes afterwards. Really, the intuitions are just um, affective uh, or sentimentalist at the um, at the start. Um, now, my problems with this sort of view are that. Um, there, we can give these evolutionary just so stories for some of these uh, affective responses, and, and maybe they do. Um, maybe some, or maybe even many of our moral intuitions uh, are governed in these ways. Um, but I don't think that evolutionary genealogies are available for, um, for all of our affective responses. Um, so just as one example, many of us would have a moral intuition or a, a judgment about uh, experiencing outrage at the idea of infanticide of severely disabled children, um, or you know, to to make this more topical, um, at least in the U.S., we have a lot of people who uh, express outrage at the idea of having mask or vaccination mandates. Um, but this sort of outrage, and it can it can include moral outrage, um, is relatively recent, biologically speaking, and. Um, especially in the case of the infanticide of severely disabled children, um, it seems biologically maladaptive. Now you could tell more stories about how like in general, 
Um, it might be adaptive for people to like be protective of infants in general. And, you know, so maybe that just bleeds over. But again, um, the idea that infanticide of um, severely disabled children, um, that the idea that that's morally wrong and morally outrageous is, I think, a very uh, new phenomenon. Um, and so it doesn't really seem to be one that um, is explained on evolutionary grounds. Um, it seems to be the result rather than the cause of moral reflection, you know. Um, as moral reflection has occurred, um, at even, including at social levels, we've now reached a point um, that, that impacts people's um, affective responses. So it's not affect leads to the judgment, but rather we've developed our judgments and our moral theories in such a way that then influences people's affect. Um, Moreover, um, affective responses don't always co coincide with their predicted moral intuitions. Um, so outrage at a competitor in industry or in a personal matter doesn't entail a moral intuition that they were wrong. Um, similarly, uh, admiration for a clever criminal uh, doesn't entail a moral intuition that they are morally good. Um, again, you could finagle these things if you really wanna focus on like moralized affective responses, but um, it, there just doesn't seem to be a neat one-to-one -one correlation um, that would suggest that you know all moral intuitions are at bottom um, based in affective responses. Um, even if we think some are like this, um, and I'm willing to go you know somewhat pluralist with these things and say we have moral intuitions from various sources. Um, some of them I think will be sentimental. Some of them may even be explicitly rational. Um, but uh, I think that. Both of those views will leave open that there are still some intuitions that need explaining in other ways. And uh, my preferred way of doing that is what I've called implicitism. Um, it's like rationalism and involving, uh, you know, reasoning or, uh, uh, or applying principles, but um, advance, I think, is to think that these, this reasoning doesn't have to be conscious and that these rules or principles don't have to be explicitly represented. They can be implicit. Um, and so, for example, uh, the first year philosophy student judges it's impermissible to push someone before Foote's trolley uh, by unconsciously reasoning from or applying some principle, you know, maybe it's the doctrine of double effect, um, maybe it's some other uh, set of principles or rules, but they've internalized those principles, they are applying them very quickly, um, and that's informing their judgments, even though they're not consciously aware of the principle. Um, and they're not consciously aware of doing any reasoning or, or application from a principle. Rather, they've just internalized certain rules um, and they, they run through those and apply those rules very quickly to the case. Um, and it can be, it could be more than one, it could be a complex set, um, but it leads to them uh, having the moral intuition. Um, now, just to develop the theory a little bit more, um, the internalized rules could be innate um, and this will come up again with the analogy with grammar. Um, so it could be some very um, seemingly obvious principles like pain is bad, helping others is good. Uh, the rules could also be explicitly learned in some cases, such as the golden rule or the doctrine of double effect or any you know, philosophical rule that's like been explicitly um, defined and uh, taught to students. But I think a lot of rules are going to be unconsciously abstracted from patterns of actions and responses like praise and punishment in the social environment. So, you know, you're growing up, whether as a, as a, you know, starting as an infant and then as you get older and even as an adult and people are going around uh, praising things and punishing things and um, having those sort of moralized responses. And I think we pick up on that and we're going to abstract from the patterns and, and piece together uh, rules um, that roughly correspond to how uh, people in our society um, are uh, morally responding to things. And so on this, this, this sort of view, if we're using intuitions and the method of cases in moral philosophy, they're helping us discover and clarify these internalized rules or what we could call an internal morality. So um, hopefully this sounds very uh, familiar to any of you who are uh, interested in generative grammar, um, because I think that this is an analogy uh, with uh, generative grammar and maybe other forms of uh, other linguistic theories. But um, so 
as I understand it, um, when we switch to talk of linguistic intuitions, we can say a lot of the same things. Uh, most paradigmatically linguistic intuitions are quick, explicit judgments about linguistic expressions, including judgments of acceptability, felicity, and entailments. Uh, less paradigmatically, I don't know, maybe they can include implicit or unconscious judgments that underlie uh, usage and interpretation. Um, they might also involve slower judgments about more complex expressions, and they might also involve um, non-propositional affective responses, uh, such as uh, understanding, uh, puzzlement, or amusement. Um, but if I understand uh, the generative grammar program, um, the, the general view is that linguistic intuitions are formed by often unconscious application of implicitly represented rules constituting an internal grammar. Um, I'm taking this from uh, Chomsky and also some things Fodor said. Um, on, on such a view, uh, the, these internal, sorry about that, these internal rules of grammar, some of them might be innate. Um, that was, that's part of Chomsky's view. As, as I understand it, it's, um, it's one of the more controversial parts of the theory, but I don't know. Um, I think some of these internal rules could also be explicitly learned. Um, especially in like non-native language acquisition when you can explicitly learn rules of grammar. Um, but a, a lot of them will also be unconsciously abstracted, abstracted from patterns of communication and responses observed in the social environment. Um, hey, Joseph? Yes. Yeah, could you just quickly say what you mean by implicitly represented? It just goes by too quickly. Uh, do you mean unconscious or do you mean something else? Um, I, I don't mean anything in particular by implicitly represented. Um, right. Uh, Probably, yeah, I would say like, like they could be unconscious and, and possibly not even accessible to the agent, um, or at least not directly. Um, you know, like I said, it can, it can be a very substantive um, cognitive achievement to formulate these, um, these rules and principles. Um, and there might be explicit representations in the brain of these. Yeah. Even in implicit representation. What's that? So I, I'm, what I'm confused by is, are you, are you thinking there's a kind of representation it's not as it were an explicit principle but somehow i don't know that's what i wanted to know it's somehow implicit in the operation of the system i wanted I just wanted to, you to say what you had in mind yeah um right now i don't have anything in mind so if there's an important distinction here um i'll be happy to note it and um you know pu puzzle over which of the things i mean um but right now i, I don't know like that's as much as i know okay. um yeah sorry um but you know this this analogy with grammar, uh, it could also apply to other what are called formally normative domains like uh, law, etiquette, game rules. I think that this model is quite broad, um, but obviously for this conference, I'm focusing on just the just the grammar. There is precedent for this sort of analogy. Um, uh, so Chomsky himself has mentioned this analogy. A number of philosophers have, and more recently, a, um, a fair number of moral psychologists have been describing and defending this analogy between um, morality and generative grammar, uh, especially under the heading of um, an interest in a universal moral grammar. Um, and so this, the common interest in the, the analogy, especially from the moral psychologists, usually involves um, what, I, what I pointed out before as, as um, the analogy with Chomsky's nativism. Um, and so uh, a lot of these moral psychologists are interested in a moral nativism. Uh, according to which humans have a dedicated innate moral sensor faculty. And uh, correspondingly, um, moral universalism, which is just a view, as least as I'm using it here, just the view that there are universal moral principles, um, you know, principles that every human uh, has internalized, um, and maybe even that like structures moral thought um, to begin with. Now, I uh, so that's the usual interest in this analogy. That's not um, the interest as I will be developing it here. So I'm not going to be building in um, either nativism or universalism. Um, that's one way of like pushing the analogy, but I'm more, more interested in the, the, the moral epistemological upshot um, if there is one. So that's the, the first uh, question answered, um, at least to some extent. Uh, so moral intuitions are quick, explicit judgments. Moral intuitions are the result of uh, often unconscious reasoning from implicitly represented rules or principles. Now, uh, does this account of moral intuitions actually vindicate their uh, epistemological role? 
Well, if we're using the analogy, um, we should ask whether um, linguistic intuitions justify linguistic beliefs. And I take it that this is a resounding yes. Uh, even, uh, even people who don't necessarily go in for generative grammar, I think, do take um, linguistic intuitions to be evidence of linguistic facts. Um, I'll note that uh, this doesn't require that intuitions have to be the only or even the best evidence for linguistic facts, but it seems like they're worth something. Um, and that's, that's all that's needed for moral philosophy as well. Um, if you wanna give a positive uh, evidential role to moral intuitions, they don't have to be the only kind of evidence, but at least some. Um, and so people might widely agree that linguistic intuitions are evidence of linguistic facts. And we could give different explanations uh, for why this would be the case, depending on what our theories of language and linguistic facts are. Um, so on Chomsky's view, at least in 1986, um, a language just is an internal grammar. And an internal grammar causes someone's linguistic intuitions. Um, and so uh, via causation, those intuitions just are evidence for facts about that grammar, that is to say, that language. Um, on a more naive view, um, facts about languages are grounded in social facts about actual usage and patterns of communication. These social facts, or, or a subset of them, are uh, also what cause the internalization of rules, which then cause intuitions. Um, and so intuitions are evidence of the socially grounded linguistic facts. Um, or on, uh, so David Lewis has a view that languages are just um, plenitudinous abstract objects. Um, and then linguistic facts are or are grounded in the social and psychological facts about which of these abstract languages a given group or individual employs. Um, but these empirical, flat, and empirical facts will include and or cause the internalization of rules, which cause intuitions. So intuitions are evidence of the uh, empirical linguistic facts. Um, on all of these views, what's, what's doing the heavy lifting is just causation. Um, and generally, if one thing causes another, then the latter is evidence for the former. Um, so then turning to moral intuitions and moral beliefs, um, if we're going to use this analogy, moral intuitions will be evidence of moral facts, just like in the linguistic case if we can give a similar story about moral facts that we want to give for um, linguistic facts. And so I'm saying moral, moral intuitions will be evidence of moral facts if those moral facts are or are grounded in the psychological and social facts that include and or cause the internalization of moral rules, since those internalized moral rules cause the moral intuitions. Um, and we can make you know, analogous views with any of the three views I just described in the linguistic case. Um, we could posit an internal moral grammar or a morality that causes moral intuitions, and then intuitions would be evidence for that. Or if you think moral facts are grounded in social facts, um, those and those certain social facts cause the internalization of moral rules, uh, those intuitions will also be um, evidence for the socially grounded moral facts. Um, or if you think a morality is just a plenitudinous abstract like set of rules or norms, um, and you think moral facts are or are grounded in empirical facts about which system a, a given group or individual employs, um, if those empirical facts uh, include or, or cause the internalization of rules, which cause intuitions, uh, then those intuitions will be evidence of those empirical moral facts. Um, so just to conclude by looking at the, the possible consequences for metaethics of such a view, um, I've said that uh, you know to use the analogy to um, support the evidential role of moral intuitions, um, we'd want to have a theory of moral facts that has them be very similar to, uh, to linguistic facts, whichever whichever kind of theory that is. Um, so I take it that moral intuitions will be evidence for moral facts um, only on, or at least using this approach, uh, only for broadly naturalist and anti-realist meta-ethical positions. Uh, which hold that moral facts are mind or response dependent in the same way that it's very plausible that linguistic facts are mind or response dependent. Um, so uh, in metaethics, non-naturalists um, and robust realists who want the moral facts to be completely um, mind independent and not depend on human beings at all, 
um, they're not going to be util able to utilize the same explanation of the evidential role of moral intuitions, which is a surprising fact, given that, um, as a matter of fact, non-naturalists and robust realists are um, some of the most heavily associated with the use of intuitions in moral philosophy, um, and specifically with intuitionism, um, the idea generally being if you've got these um, abstract uh, mind-independent moral facts, you might even need a special um, faculty that can detect them and give us direct access to them. Um, so if everything I've, I'm saying is correct, even though um, non-naturalists and intuitions often are taken to go hand in hand, it's actually the, um, the naturalists and the anti-realists who have a better explanation of, of the evidential role of intuitions. Um, finally, um, so even though I'm, I'm gesturing towards or an argument uh, for uh, moral anti-realism, um, this is consistent both with like individual and social relativism, but also with um, innate and or universal moral principles, um, whether you take those, those um, universal moral principles to be like a necessary feature of any beings like us that are sufficiently rational or, or moral beings, um, or if you just think uh, as like an entirely contingent matter, uh, human beings have certain, um, you know, certain universal moral architecture in their brains. Um, I don't know which of these views is more like Chomsky's view, like the view that like all language would have to uh, be structured in, in a certain way, or if it's just that humans contingently have a certain architecture that structures language um, in a certain way. Uh, either of those views would be consistent with everything I've said. Um, although, again, that's not the focus. That's not my interest, at least in this talk. Um, uh, and I direct you to the universal moral grammar uh, um, research program if you're interested in you know those nativism and, and uh, universalist conclusions. Um, so that is uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, thank you for any questions um, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Yosef. Um, let's move to the q and If you have questions for Joseph, please raise your hands. Peter. I can't hear you, sorry. Let me let me stop clapping a second here. Mm -hmm. here now. After I scolded John for <laughs> <laughs> all right. I cannot stop clapping. That's all there is to it. Yeah, does anybody know how to stop clapping? I'm trying to stop clapping. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. All right. Um, it was okay. that good, huh? It was that good. Uh, <laughs> actually, I am a big fan of this uh, and this sort of connection between linguistics and uh, um, uh, moral theory. And I've just pasted into the chat a, a paper that will be of interest to you. It's by Peter Railton. I don't know if you know it. It's called Normative Guidance. It came out in 2006. Okay. Um, and actually, uh, Railton's paper, it, it is a version of implicitism, as you call it, and it okay. goes a long ways to uh, answering Georges' question as well, uh, because the idea is that there are these, there are these unconscious rules that are explicitly represented in the mind-brain, as it were, and then where do the judgments come from? The judgments come from cases, there's like he describes it as kind of like a set point register where you sort of divert from what the rule says you should be doing and then it gives you simply a feeling of discomfort so you don't have a direct judgment that this is the rule mm -hmm. similarly in linguistics in linguistics we just say well you have judgments of acceptability and then you have to construct a theory right Mm -hmm. And then the interesting thing here is about the implicit regarding the implicit nature of this stuff is that he applies it to these Nomi or Pali cases with Huck Finn, you know, mm -hmm. you probably know these cases, the other people may not. So uh, roughly speaking, the idea is Huckleberry Finn is going up the Mississippi or down, I don't know, <laughs> with an escaped slave named Jim. And at one point he meets some people on the shore and they say, is that a slave with you? 
And he says, no, and he, he, he is sort of, as it were, disappointed with himself because he believes he told a lie and he did what is explicitly the wrong thing, right? By, by the community in which he came from. But he, he just, as he says, he, it just didn't sit right with him. Okay, so how does that work? On the Railton story, there is this explicitly represented rule, which is some Kantian rule about respect for persons. He had some superficial prescriptive rule, right? Which is that you're supposed to turn in an escaped slave. And so he thinks because he's flouting or, or violating the explicit rule that he's doing something wrong. Yet inside he has this judgment or intuition that he did something wrong because that internal judgment is sensitive to the implicit rule. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's the basic idea. So anyway, I, I was just gonna say, I uh, liked the talk and I agree with you. And I think that the Railton, the Railton reference would be right in line with what you're, uh, what you're looking at here. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Also Railton actually uses an explicit uh, example of linguistics as an illustration of what he's up to. Okay, great. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Thanks. I've read a lot of Railton because I, I like a lot of his work, but I haven't yeah. read that particular piece. Yeah, this is a good one. Yeah. Great. Uh, John? Hi. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I was just so, <clears throat> I was thinking of whether there are cases, so if one was to accept the uh, linguistic analogy, where uh, you would have, and this goes back to a point Peter just made, uh, where you would have, um, uh, if you like, moral judgments that are um, um, unacceptable or at least you know so you would judge them to be um <clears throat> yeah you, you you would judge some action to be the kind of wrong thing to do but nevertheless uh, according to the sort of underlying principles uh it was in fact you know sort of good as it were do you see mm -hmm. what i mean so uh in in a linguistic case you've got a difference between what chomsky refers to as grammatical and something being acceptable mm -hmm. is it in the moral case is do you still have the same kind of uh division there that's a good question um so there are lots of um you know just like we can there are all sorts of uh, uh properties we could be interested in ascribing to yeah. a linguistic expression grammaticality acceptability felicity you know all of these things um a lot of moral philosophers have like drawn distinctions between various moral properties and evaluations. Um, you know, you've got like the the evaluative on the one hand, good and bad, and so on. You've yeah. also got like um, directive, like should and ought, and then and then philosophers have even you know naively you might have thought that some of these things were just as about the same thing. You know, like should and ought and must. But now philosophers are even making like pretty fine grained distinctions between those and saying um, it might be that like it's not the case that you must morally must do this, but you morally should do it. Um, like um, and like uh, Thompson says, you know, it's it might be per morally permissible, but it would be morally indecent. Um, and so there are all, lots of these fine grained distinctions. And I think that you, you know, that could be analogous to the to this like grammaticality versus yeah um, except yeah I, I, thought, I was thinking of the Kant uh, case from you know the supposed right to lie from the philanthropy where you know the, the axe murderer and you know and you're not even supposed to lie to the axe murderer and kind of and I, I I take the point there being something like you know according to a moral law yeah, you just don't lie. The moral law doesn't specify who you can lie to and who you can't. But nevertheless, very, very few people are going to think, yeah, it's okay to tell the truth to the axe murderer. Is that, would that so? Sort of... I, I think that is the sort of, um, the sort of like mixed judgment you can get to, right? You can get these, yeah. um, 
and 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 I think also like grammaticality and acceptability and these other um, you know linguistic evaluations. Yes. Um, it, you might require training to even be aware of the difference, and yeah, yeah. it might be a, a pretty sophisticated um, evaluation you give of lying in that case, where you say it's like, yeah, it's like still kind of bad in a way, but like all to get all like all in all, you should do it. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think there's room for for a very like complex. Uh, very complex moral intuitions and also like a more uh, complex like theory of the kinds of things that we can judge in our intuitions. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you. George? Yeah, um, two things I want to um, mention. Uh, one is uh, I'm really quite taken aback by the, the fact that in so much moral philosophy, there's this one word, moral, that's used to corral an enormous range of, kind of different kinds of judgments. So for example, in Haight's work, I mean, he concentrates on incest. Um, and uh, that fellow at Harvard too also concentrates on just trolley problems. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, um, you know, what counts as, you know, under the normal cover moral is such a wide variety of issues from, you know, just biases about, you know, cannibalism. Yeah, I mean, it's distasteful to eat other human beings, but it's hard to see what's actually deeply morally wrong about, wrong about it. It's just, you know, we have a, a repugnant reaction, many of us. Uh, they're socially indoctrinated, you know, you know, results of social indoctrination and prejudice. Uh, and then as Kant, I think, you know, makes a very good case, well, and, and Rawls, well, there's a very special set of cases having to do with justice and injustice and how you treat people as ends of themselves or you do uh, worthy of respect. Anyway, all those <laughs> need to be distinguished uh, in the light, you know, if you're going to apply the grammatical analogy in the same way that Chomsky will, of course, distinguish, you know, memory limitations, right, you know, for center embeddings um, uh, or computational, you know, uh, uh, limitations uh, from the grammar. Okay? So you have to really, you know, take, I think, take the moral of Chomsky's, uh, the analogy to be, yeah, there are lots of different kinds of processes that might be responsible for the superficial right, reactions people have uh, of repugnance or you know, uh, condemnation. Uh, a second issue that is, uh, I, uh, Bob has bothered me uh, ever since I've, I've thought about this for quite a few years myself, uh, is the fact that at least since the emergence of principles and parameters in linguistics in the uh, uh, 70s and 80s, um, the, there's, there's been a uh, an issue. Sorry, there's been a focus on uh, the principles that govern the operation of this machine, okay, rather than actual explicit hypotheses. You see, I, I think you know, Rawls and others have often been overly influenced by the what I call the page thirty of aspects view, where um, uh, uh, the child's choosing a grammar is a kind of a process of hypothesis confirmation. You know, where the grammar is an explicit hypothesis. And then you uh, you get lots of evidence, and you choose which hypothesis fits the data best. And uh, I take it one of the interesting features of the principles and parameters picture was that no, you just have these principles that govern how this machine operates. The same way we might have principles of digestion or principles of metabolism, uh, and they don't have to be represented or confirmed. No, they just operate. What may get confirmed or disconfirmed are you know you have particular pairings of, of, of morphemes and phonological items or uh, meanings or the setting of parameters. But those are gonna be a very small subset. And it's not clear to me how the moral analogy could be worked out in that way. Uh, in particular, you know, suppose it turned out that you know, the principles you know, uh, that govern the grammar really had to do with issues of economy, you know, subjacency, uh, locality, you know, constituent structure and so forth. And you'd wanna say, well, if those are the principles, yeah, I don't think I'm going to decide my moral, you know, my moral life on the basis of yeah, there are barely formal constraints on how my brain works. Right. Um, uh, you know, that just seems irrelevant. And so that's where it seems to me the analogy between uh, morals and um, uh, grammar may seriously break down. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something as it were it's supposed to be. You know, in the ultimate cases, you know, rational, you know, rationally defensible about morality. <laughs> in a way that uh, uh, needn't arise in the case of uh, principles of grammar. Hmm. 
Right. Um, yeah. Thank you for for both of those uh, points. Um, I completely agree that moral philosophers use moral in all sorts of different ways, and I think that there's probably a lot of uh, merely verbal uh, agreement and a lot of talking past in a lot of cases. So, um, yeah, no, I completely agree that uh, it would be helpful for like every moral philosopher and metaethicist to always just start their paper with, when I use the word moral, I mean this. Um, and yeah, similarly, right, like um, we can, it could be that there- I was thinking, especially for psychologists who, who think they're investigating you know, moral intuitions. Oh, that too, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, right, because like, you know, some people think morality has, has this strong connection to rationality and reasons. Other people think, um, or, you know, you know, like Scanlon and even Aristotle has a view that's kind of like this of justice, um, that it's just about like what you owe to other people. Um, and it's not even like a, something that could be like self-concerning. It's like strictly pro-social and other concerning. Um, yeah. So I think, um, I think there is a pluralism here and I think that it could be worthwhile to, um, invent like, you know, abstract from these, uh, interacting and like focus on the, the subsystems, the sub moral systems kind of like you might do with grammar. Um, and then as far as, um, the second point, um, so, um, If, right, so there, I, I wanted to be kind of neutral on the, the question of how much, how much of this, um, you know, how, just how far we want to take the, the universal grammar analogy and like, do we, do we really think that there are these like very formal uh, criteria that are the principles um, behind uh, moral judgments um, in the same way that there might be these like very um, not, not, not a represented or not like a, not like a rule in a, in a usual sense um, that we follow when we're for making linguistic um, expressions and, and evaluating them. Um, so I wanted to be kind of neutral, but of course, you know, like, like Kant, does think that like there is only one way of like thinking morally and it's something that like only all and only rational creatures can do um and it is this highly formal thing and it's it's roughly you know like um universalizing your motivation and not making an exception for yourself um yeah uh you know i i would want to leave open that um maybe there isn't a, a single set of formal principles that are innate and universal and like a structural part of um of all moral thinking um, my point was it'd be they'd be irrelevant it seems they'd, they'd be, be irrelevant they'd be, although they, uh, the principles are of course morally relevant to which grammar you're speaking okay um how you're using uh, they uh, it would be odd to find those kinds of principles to be relevant to whether an action was moral or not Mm, okay. Really not, is that the reason you think lying is bad? Is because it's a, an, an economy principle, <laughs> right? right. You see, you take the wind out of the moral, you know, sails, as it were. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think I think a, a similar, maybe not quite the same, but a similar sort of objection gets raised to certain uh, moral theories that they are, uh, you know, objectionably like self-concerning sometimes. Like if like, is that really what morality is about? Like that seems to like get the wrong, um, to like put what we care about in the wrong place. Um, similarly, like the debate between in moral motivation um, between whether you should be like motivated by um, like people's well-being and like the right making features de re or or the rightness of the of the act and so on um yeah so i take i take the point about um how how literally do we want to take the the analogy with the moral principles and if if we do think that they're like pretty similar to the linguistic ones maybe they actually don't locate um morality in the in the right place so thanks um I think Peter has a second question. Peter, go ahead. 
You are mute. Isn't John still waiting on a question? Or did um, he already? Oh, um, I was going to ask a follow up, but you. Yeah, this is a kind of a follow up too. Yeah. So go ahead. So do you want me to go ahead? Could you turn up your volume or sorry, or put your voice closer to the screen? Hey, talk to me, George. Yeah, both of you actually. It was a little hard to hear both of you. <laughs> sorry. But yeah, John. Yeah. John, your your face is actually out of the screen. Could you move the screen so you we can see your lovely face? Oh, thank you. You always so kind to me. Um, yeah, no, what I was going to say is there's a kind of difference here between a theory explaining why you have the judgments you have and whether those judgments are kind of correct or not. Whereas, so, you know, say like with intuitions. So I take it in a language case, you want a theory to explain why you have the judgments you have. The theory isn't going to sort of explain, or at least the grammatical theory isn't going to explain whether those judgments are true or not. Whereas in the moral case, it seems that you want to be able to say, yeah, regardless of why I have these moral intuitions, I want to know whether they're correct or not. Does that sort of speak to what you was um, asking? Um. <laughs> It sounds like it, but um, I well, but, but, hold, hold on. It's just that you know, we do think what what could be the basis for grammar other than our intuitions, and I take it the um, uh, 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 except for your gra the, the grammatical machine of uh, the principles of the gra grammatical machine. Whereas it, if you apply it to morals, I thought the point was to make that analogy. And say yes, the normativity comes from the principles that uh, you know are the mission by which the mission. Oh, I see. Oh. And so, what, what's yeah, the other source you'd have for uh, for justifying something morally? Right. Yeah. So I, I take it that again, you know, what the the debate in linguistics about whether you're, you know, whether the proper method is cases and intuitions or just like corporate data or something, you know, I take it everyone agrees that intuitions are going to be uh, at least, you know, some evidence of the actual linguistic facts, facts about language, facts about grammar. Um, and so I was hoping that, you know, if we use that analogy, we can, we can get at the, the idea that um, moral intuitions are at least some evidence, maybe not the only evidence for the moral facts, including, um, you know, not just what moral judgments does an individual or a group make, but like, you know, are they the correct ones? Are, do they track the actual moral facts or are they um, mistaken in the same way that, um, uh, that like a perceptual belief can be mistaken? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I take it though, in the language case, <clears throat> you don't take there to be a range of moral facts which are independent of your capacity so you know so even if you think there are these language facts mm -hmm. they're not independent of your cognition whereas in the moral case i take it that the part of the the idea of kind of morality is that it's not simply psychological in that kind of reductive sense does that make sense right well i, I take it some moral theorists want to use the grammatical analogy to ground morals Right, in this way. So they would, oh, okay. they, they yeah, would exactly. disagree with the moral realism that you may be advocating. Exactly, yeah. So some some oh. moral philosophers and metaphysicists go in for this, like call it non-naturalist, call it robust realist, but this view that there is a moral reality, a more like moral facts that, that um, don't have any sort of psychological or social um, mm -hmm. explanation. They stand apart and we have and it's our job to discover them. And so what I was, uh, what I take this to be suggesting is like one way of explaining the, the evidential role of moral intuitions for the people who want to do so, um, and that's most moral philosophers, I think, um, is to actually say, no, uh, we should just think that morality is, doesn't float free of the psychological and social facts. It's actually um, partly explained by them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, two things. 
first of all, there was a, a story floating around that in the earlier drafts of On Justice, Rawls had a whole lot of references to Chomsky and linguistic theory and that Drebin made him take it out, something mm -hmm. like that. So you, you should, uh, you might, if there's a Rawls archive there, it might be kind of interesting to look that stuff up. Uh, I also wanted to say something defending you from George, George a little bit. Um, I mean, the thesis you're defending here is the implicitism part. And, you know, the extent of your analogy to linguistics is presumably just, um, well, it's like linguistics in that the rules are implicit and that we have judgments which can help shed light on those implicit rules. Now, it's not gonna, I mean, I think Chomsky even believes something like this, but we have to keep in mind that it's going to be a different module uh, than the language faculty, mm -hmm. even though there are certain similarities to it. And the architecture on which it supervenes is possibly going to be different, by which I mean, it's not, Presumably, it's not something like merge, and I guess this is mm -hmm. George's point. It would be really weird if you were just merging these merging these structures and came up with ethics out of that, mm -hmm. right? right? So there has to be some other kind of thing going on, which will be different. But I mean, it seems to me that at least your central point about the implicitism part is fine, especially since you argued that well you know, that Im those implicit rules could be coming from outside, you know, from mm -hmm. culture or whatever the case right. might be. Yeah. And uh, you could even connect this with the abstract stuff because there are views in the philosophy of mathematics, for example, that certain syntactic structures are vehicles that enable us to have epistemic access to these abstracta. I mean, this was Charles Parsons' way of making sense of Girdle on and his Platonism. So Parsons' idea was, well, you have these abstract structures and they help you to get epistemic access to the, the Platonic realm. So theoretically, you could take the implicitism and say there are these internal structures and those aren't, those aren't the moral rule, rules, but they're the kind of ticket to get access to the moral rules. I mean, I, there are lots of what different moves you have available to yourself here. Yeah, look, I just want, want to press that the, it doesn't seem to be quite the role for the you know, economy principles in grammar. Oh, well, yeah, no, I in, agree in with the that. Case, yeah. In the case of morale, because morality has to, in some sense, in a way that grammar does not have to be, uh, amenable to reason and to rational and to justification. And does that well, I mean, that, maybe that, that, uh, that maybe. separates out from mere principles. Right? Maybe I mean, but they could have like economy principles in 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 moral theory. I mean, Kant basically gives you a kind of economy. No, principle. no, no. I, uh, what I meant by principles, I meant you know formal principles. Say of economy. I mean, we're simply economy and not principles that you know, would not uh, tie in with a moral justification and reason. Well, I, I just think it's hard to know between grammar and morality. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know until I see some sort of formal account of where wherein these principles come. But I, I mean, I take your point. I mean, I, I, I it, it's a good objection. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the way I understood George's um, point earlier, it wasn't to say like the the analogy as I'm presenting it is is to say that like the moral stuff falls out of the linguistic cognitive architecture um, but rather you know in the same way that when we actually do the the linguistics and the cog side we discover what these what the principles are for the linguistic stuff um, it's it's not anything that is in the grammar textbooks right and similarly, like if if we wanted to carry this um, this analogy further for the moral stuff, we and we did all of the the science behind it, we might discover that like the the principles that structure moral thought are nothing like the the rules that we actually find in uh, philosophy books on morality. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that that seems well, not like only that we wouldn't find them, but we'd, we'd find them morally irrelevant. Okay. Right. That too. And, yes, and, exactly. And the fact that, you know, that promising may be eco more economical than telling lies. <laughs> it's not going to be a reason that I should keep my promises, right? Right. Yeah. Um, right. And so, so uh, like, I think what Peter suggested, it's like, um, I, I, I kind of want to be neutral because I don't know. I want to, I'd be interested to see how the science shakes out and whether, whether we get, you know, a formal principles that do seem like they could be relevant to morality. It like in, um, in a way that like Kant could be like optimistic about very formal principles that it turns out explain, um, all of the more, um, intuitive moral principles that we accept. Um, or if they turn out to be this like sort of very bizarre, um, you know, co computer-like principle. Shortest move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kant would be happy with shortest move. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, so right. So I, I, I would just want to leave open. Yeah, maybe that, maybe that is the way it turns out, um, or maybe not. And uh, uh, if, if the, if the analogy breaks down at that point. Um, you know, I, I'm say, I'll say, you know, fine, it's just an analogy. Um, I'm afraid we are out of time, unfortunately. Uh, Joseph, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, thank, thank you all. And thank you everybody for joining the session. Uh, um, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. So, uh, bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>